Okay, guys, uh, it's a time, so let's just start. Um, today, we are going to start uh, antiviral drugs. Last week, we started about uh, antibiotic. Antibiotic can mean many different things, but antibiotic, conventionally, we use that as a antibacterial. Okay, so now we move uh, our target to virus. Coronavirus is a kind of a virus, not bacteria. Okay. So as usual, we start with this uh, the quiz problem. Be ready. Okay, let's start. <laughs> Is that difficult? Uh, for bacteria to live and proliferate, proliferate means uh, it multiply, make its uh, copies as a daughter cells. Uh, for bacteria to live, what do they need? Caption, what does a bacteria need to live and proliferate? Um. Just energy. They need energy, like water and also nutrients. Yes. Uh, kind of things they need. And proper temperature is uh, helpful, but we could find some bacteria, even hot spring, up to 70 degree. Almost, a, you know, boiling at the, near the boiling point at the degree. Hot spring, they can still survive. So in hot dog or the dead, dead body, if there are nutrients, they can survive and then they can proliferate. Cosmic space, uh, well, maybe they can hibernate in the space, but they cannot proliferate because there is no nutrient around, number one. Number two, there is a very strong cosmic light, like a UV or X-ray, and they can be killed by those uh, the light. So this is some other basic requirement for life of forms survive. If I give you the same question for virus. Okay, good point. What is the basic difference between bacteria and virus? Who gave you the answer for plant body? Me. Who, Doyon? Why, why did you choose a plant body? Because oh. I, I think steamed hot dog will be correct. Uh, because? Why did you think steamed hot dog Virus can live. Mm. Virus can live in. I think virus can live in hot place. Bacteria can live in hot place. Virus maybe can live in hot place too. But if you look at the question, 
I didn't say just leave. I said proliferate, means multiply. If the environment is very difficult, still the life forms like a bacteria or the life forms, they can evolve to adapt to that new environment. So it's a difficult, but they can live and proliferate. But here, the key point is virus does not have its own metabolism, right? Virus needs some live cells around. That live cell can be either animal cell or plant cell or bacteria. Any kind of thing is maybe possible. At least they need to have some real metabolism containing life forms. That's the important part. Just a nutrient itself, like a steamed hot dog, it can be good nutrient for bacteria. But for virus, they, if there is not living cell, then they cannot survive. And they cannot proliferate in that environment. Okay, that's the key part. Virus needs other live machinery, live cells around. Okay, move on. <clears throat> Okay, very good. At least you know about the wavelengths of uh, visible light. So one end is a uh, red light. Red light is about 700 nanometer. How about the other end? Okay, good. One of you gave the answer is 200 nanometer. 200 nanometer is a UV. It's much shorter than visible light. Um, actually, 400 nanometer is near to a violet. Blue color may be starting from 450, but approximately, let's say, blue and violet is a similar color. So our visible light is, uh, the range is between 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer. If the wavelength is shorter, then it has a higher energy or lower energy? Higher energy. Wavelength is shorter, that means the frequency is higher because the speed is the same. So it has a higher energy. That's why shorter than visible light has a very high energy. 200 nanometer of UV, it has a very strong energy. What we call here, the longer than 700 nanometer, near to the 1,000 nanometer, means one micrometer. What is the range? What is the name of the range of the light in this range? Infrared. So this is IR, infrared. This is ultraviolet. Ultra means is higher, infra means is lower. So that means energy wise, this is a higher energy and this one. And then red light in terms of energy wise is almost a half of our other blue light. Right? And then IR is much lower energies. Now I gave you some question about the visible size. Okay, very good. Whether you memorized or maybe you understood those are the physical law. Anyway, the ideal minimum size, theoretical minimum size we can see is half of wavelengths. So if you choose 200 nanometer, what is your assumption? Which light did you use? Did you use a red light or did you use a blue light? Blue light. Blue light has a higher energy and also better transmission. That's why, you know, the connection of your computer to your headset, we call Bluetooth, not red tooth. Right? That means that they use shorter wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths for communication because it has a higher energy, better penetrations. Okay, move on.
okay this is a little disappointing so this is the basic material you should have studied in the video clips for the entry of uh, influenza virus into the host cell they have a spike two different kind of spikes one is a uh, h protein and there's one more h protein is uh, when they enter they bind to the surface receptor of host cells what is the name of the uh, the h represent hemoglobin hemagglutinin it's a little uh, difficult to pronounce but hemagglutinin okay that's one kind of a protein simply you can say h protein h protein is uh, for entry the next question you may expect what can be exit Okay, great. So influenza has a two different kinds of a protein, H protein and N protein. What, what does the N represent? Neuraminic acid. Neuraminic acid. So this is neuraminic acid is a carbohydrate structure. N is the enzyme which cleave that other neuraminic uh, the acid structure. So when they exit, they need to have this uh, cleavage enzyme to release the particle from the cell to the outside, okay? That's why influenza virus has a H and N as a combination. There are some numbers of H protein, some numbers of N protein. Depending on their identity of those protein, you can call either H1, N1, or H1, N3, kind of different combinations. So in comparison, coronavirus does not have both of them. Coronavirus has only one kind to enter. Okay, <clears throat> what does that mean? If the, rel uh, the relenza is uh, working against N protein, can you explain what is the mechanism of it? Dongo, could you tell what is the mechanism of relenza, vi uh, relenza against influenza virus? Uh, it mimics the structure of sialic acid. And so that the N protein can alternatively bond to relenza instead of N, instead of the sialic acid. So virus cannot move to other places because they're still bond to the host cell. Okay, you explained uh, the correctly. Uh, if you say this, whether this is attacking which step of those uh, the, the virus action, uh, which step is blocked? There can be multi-step of a virus, right? So it can be entry, proliferation inside of, a, of the cell, and exit. Which step is blocked? Uh, it's the exit phase. At the exit stage, right? So once the cell is infected, then it's very difficult to selectively remove the virus from the infected cell. So then our option is either kill kill the infected cell or block the exit of the virus from the infected cells. So most likely at our drugs, we cannot save the infected cell. It's a, the more difficult. We give up the infected cell and just block the, the exit. Then don't let them spread. Don't let them the, the leave the infected cell, just to capture them inside the cells. So Rolanda's target is an M protein. That means this is a blocking their exit, okay? If there is any drug which can attack bind to hemagglutinin H, then what can be the mechanism? Which step is blocked? Entry. Yes, entry is blocked, right? Even though virus is circulating in our body, we prevent the entry of a virus into the cell. 
So that's the blocking uh, in this case. For blocking the entry, we can use two approaches. One is either blocking H protein on virus, or we can block the receptor of our cells to bind to the H protein. So both approaches should work, right? Anyway, there's a two partners. One partner is on virus. The other partner is on our cell surface, so-called receptor. Any blocking reagent, either of those are target. Anyway, they can inhibit the entry of those virus into the cell. Okay. Okay. If Relenza is a targeting M protein, how about the Tamiflu? What is the target of the Tamiflu? Someone? M protein. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same target protein, it's also N protein. But there was uh, some difference between Tamiflu and Relenza, uh, Relenza, right? Tamiflu and Relenza. Okay, Relenza is an inhaler. Inhaler means it's a spray. It's just a spray inside. Uh, the mouse to uh, the deliver the drug compounds directly to the lung inside. Okay. Oral drug means we have a pill. Syrup is a similar way. Oral drug is a solid state. Syrup is just liquid. It's the same thing. IV injection is injection through the syringe. IV means intravenous through vein. Okay. It's a mechusa. So it's an injection of the method. So Relenza is used as a spray. Spray is not easy to use for babies, right? So that's why the inhaler, the Relenza, has a some application limit over ages for the convenience and also the other issues. Okay, this question is a little tricky. So Relenza and Tamiflu is targeting the same N protein over influenza. Quinolone is uh, the anti-cancer drug and which the Tectron is go, the, was supposed to present the last time uh, because of the time limit, he couldn't uh, present. Ivermectin, actually this compound, this drug, have you ever heard about Ivermectin? Nobody heard about it, Ivermectin? During the last several days in newspaper, this drug name came up several times. Anybody remember? Buchungje. So this is a parasite drug, Buchungje. But it seems like this compound, somebody claimed that this compound has some effect against the coronavirus. So we don't know the exact mechanism or whether that's a true or not. So that's a little tricky question here. But anyway, three of these come uh, the drugs is kind of working against the virus. And this one is working only for bacteria. So we are going to hear that today, the Tectron's presentation uh, the continuing from uh, the last uh, the week to figure out the mechanism of the of quinolone. Tectron, are you ready? <coughs> oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Oh, oh. okay. Um, I will talk about uh, quinolones. <coughs> uh, quinolones is a uh, antibacterial drugs that interfere DNA replication process. And these are, these are uh, quinolone family. Uh, they all have this bicyclic core structure. Uh, quinolone discovered accidentally in 1962 as a byproduct of some research on the anti-malarial drug. And quinolone uh, can be used against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria uh, because quinolone's targets are 
two pi isomer is two and two pi isomer is four. But this is these are enzyme that involved in DNA replication process, and both gram positive and gram negative bacteria have these two enzymes. Also, what is DNA gyrase? Uh, <clears throat> DNA gyrase uh, comprised of two subunits, A subunits and B subunits. And DNA gyrase role is uh, removing the torsional stress of DNA. Uh, while during the DNA replication process, uh, the junction of the DNA have high level of torsional stress. So DNA gyrase remove that torsional stress of DNA. So DNA gyrase works during the DNA replication. And in case of topoisomer is four, uh, this enzyme also comprised of two subunits and topoisomer is four and DNA gyrase looks very similar. And this enzyme rules is removing nodes in the chromosome. Not, and <clears throat> so, and separating daughter chromosomes after DNA replication process. So topoisomer isomerase four works uh, the later stage of DNA replication and after the DNA replication. Uh, this picture shows the topoisomerase, a blue and red called A subunits and green one is B subunits. Topoisomerase uh, attached to the DNA and uh, this enzyme cut the DNA and remove, reduce the torsional strain and uh, ligate and cut ligate, cut ligate is repeated. Uh, and the right side that DNA cut called enzyme DNA cleavage complex. Uh, so quinolone interact with this enzyme DNA cleavage complex. Uh, this is how quinolones interact with topoisomerase. The red one is the part of topoisomerase and black one is quinolone. And this purple, uh, four purple sphere is water molecule. And the middle of the water, there is a metal ion. So we call this water metal ion bridge. So quinolone uh, interact with topoisomerase through this water metal ion bridge. And water metal ion bridge are uh, connect with serine part of the topoisomerase and quinolone. Uh, but a human cell also have topoisomerase too. So why human cells is safe against quinolone? Uh, because I said bacteria, topoise, bacteria's topoisomerase are comprised of two subunits but human topoisomerase is just a single polypeptide chain. And that is a difference of protein structure. And human topoisomerase lack the serine part that anchors the water metal ion bridge. So uh, human cells have uh, very, uh, don't have much this serine part. So water metal ion bridge cannot, contact, cannot uh, connect with this serine part and quinolone cannot interact with humans' top isomeries. So this is why human cell is safe from quinolone. Okay, then what is the function of quinolones? Uh, quinolones, I said quinolones are interact with uh, this enzyme DNA cleavage complex. So when quinolone act this uh, top isomeries, it increasing the concentration of enzyme DNA cleavage complexes. Uh, that means uh, DNA are cut, then DNA cannot ligate. So uh, if the strand breaks, overwhelm these processes, it can lead to cell death. Uh, and there are three types of resistance. 
The first one is target mediated resistance. Uh, it means uh, bacteria have mutation in gyrase and topoisomerase spore, and the most commonly mutated part is serin. Uh, so uh, mutation of in the serin part leads to water metal ion which cannot form and quinolone cannot interact with polysomerase. The second part is the second part type is plasmid mediated resistance. Uh, QNR protein is uh, derived from plasmid, and QNR protein bind to gyrase and topoisomerase four to protect from quinolone. And the other is area lowering the number of enzyme targets on the chromosome. So bacteria reduce the number of polysomerase for this DNA replication. And the last one is plasmid encoded efflux pumps. But these pumps uh, uh, can decrease concentration of quinolones in the cell. So bacteria can reduce the number of quinolones in their inside their cell. And last type is chromosome mediated resistance. Uh, quinolones can enter to the bacteria through porin. And so uh, this resistance means under expression of porins decreases drug uptake. So quinolones uh, have difficulty to enter the bacteria. And overexpression of chromosome encoded efflux pumps increases stroke retention in the cell. These uh, are similar to the uh, plasma mediated resistance. Okay, uh, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Tekjun. Uh, do you have a question for Tekjun? Tekjun oh, yes. gave, gave you the mechanism of the quinolone, how it works, and also why the quinolone does not have side effect to human cell and also several possible uh, resistance mechanisms, okay? So in comparison to previous uh, the week, uh, we studied about the penicillin and also vancomycin. Uh, most of the drugs are targeting cell wall of bacteria. Now today's quinolone's function is attacking DNA synthesis of bacteria, okay? That's the mechanism uh, difference. And also there are some more details uh, to given today. There may be some questions that uh, uh, you may have, I guess. Hejian, will you start? Yeah. Uh, actually, it sounds like the quinolone can target any kind of bacteria without specificity. I think it can be dangerous because we have very uh, useful bacteria in our body. So how, they, how can they target specific pathogen bacteria you, you want to kill? Uh, I don't consider about that. <laughs> so I don't okay. know how to kill them. First, the selectivity was uh, between bacteria and our uh, topoisomerase. Right now, the Sejin's question is uh, going further. Among different bacteria, how can this attack selectively only bad bacteria and keeping good bacteria? That's more difficult, I guess. At least for uh, the comparison between human uh, the enzyme and bacterial enzyme. What did you say, Tekjun? Is that this enzyme has a cleavage and ligase to function together? Tekjun, did you say this enzyme has a cleavage function and also ligase function together? Or there is uh, another enzyme which have ligase uh, uh, the function separately? Uh, no, uh, this enzyme have both function of cleavage and ligase. And if you add this drug, quinolone, which step is inhibited? Uh, ligase is inhibited because... Okay, yeah. cleavage was allowed, but reconnection over ligase, ligase means it's a reconnection. That's a ligase. So, double helical DNA has a high strength, 
and then we need to open it for making copy of it. And then cleavage is okay, but reconnection is blocked. That's why many step, many of the site of the DNA is cleaved, not reconnected. That's why they can be toxic and they go to the cell death, right? Yes. Okay, maybe it's a little, a little more difficult. Uh, basically speaking, we can say, generally speaking, topoisomerase in one species is uh, different from the other species. By looking at their, uh, the difference of the structure, maybe we can design those uh, drugs. So first the concern is against human enzyme, whether it can be blocked or not. Now targeting other bacteria, it may be more difficult, and also there may be too many bacteria in our body. So considering them all may not be easy to consider. Most likely it's a tested and check whether it's a tolerable or not. I think that's uh, the real situation, I guess. Other question? I have a question too. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Tepjun, can you move to the plasmid mediated reg resistance? Okay. Uh, at, uh, you, you said that QNR protein binds to topomase 4 or gyrus uh, to block the medicine to bind the, those enzyme. So this uh, or this QNR protein uh, affect the uh, these enzymes affinity to bind to DNA or not? Uh, can you speak one more time about the last part? Uh, so, so QNR protein binds to this enzyme, and yes. does th this bind affect the affinity of uh, gyrus or topomerase? Or uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, your question is uh, right that uh, when QNR, QNR protein binds to gyrus and topomerase four, uh, it leads a uh, low affinity to combine with DNA. And okay, Joan jo gave a good assumption of the how to interpret your presentation of the material. Section, if you look at your the two sentences, first sentence says QNR protein bind to gyrase. Second sentence is lowering the number of enzyme targets. Is it connected function in? Uh, uh, no, no, no. This is separate. Yes, separate. These three okay, are, then, are separate. Or separate. Okay. Then first one, you should say first, QNR protein is increased in resistant bacteria. It resistant uh, the virus. Yes, resistant. So QNR protein is increased. Uh, yes. Okay. Then if it's increased, then what does it do? Uh, if QNR protein increased, uh, QNR protein bind to enzyme instead of quinolone. And then it's uh, protecting the enzyme? Yes, protecting the enzyme from quinolone. Okay. Second line also seems like a similar function. Is that, how is it different from the first line? Uh, first first uh, sentence means QNR protein binds to enzyme. And the second okay. sentence means uh, there are enzyme targets on the DNA that topoisomerase will bind to the DNA. So bacteria lower the number of enzyme targets on the DNA, surface on the DNA. So how, how do the bacteria lower the target? Uh, I didn't find that step, but I on this result only? Well, there can be maybe two possibilities. One is maybe change the sequence. Change yeah. the sequence of a DNA, and then it avoid the enzyme binding. Or your title is a plasmid mediated resistance. So plasmid carries that sequence. It's a more, cop more numbers of copies, and it can compete with the binding site. That can be another Hostility. Mm. You have two pages. One page is a plasmid mediated. Next page is a, uh, next page is a chromosome, chromosome based, right? So yes. chromosome based 
may mean more like mutations on chromosome change its sequence. A previous one is a plasmid mediated. Then, mm, yes, it may have a diff different strategy, maybe competing by providing more similar sequence, and those sequences bind to the enzyme. There may be another possibility, which is the case. Oh, uh, I think later, later one to plus uh, completely. Okay. You check that uh, the fact and then uh, send me the answer later. Then I will uh, upload that information to the to the, our class site. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there are two possibilities. Other question for this? Okay, let me give you one question. So here the plasmid and also the next page of uh, the chromosome based pumping out is pumping out is always bacteria's uh, the first choice to remove those drugs. And next page, Tekjun showed that also blocking the intake. So porins is kind of a transporter, which is a pump in. So pump in selectively block the entry of a drug. That can be another effective way. Anyway, reduce the concentration of the drug inside the bacteria, either blocking of the entry or by pumping out, remove the, the drug from the bacteria. Either case, it may work. Now this quinolone, why this quinolone cannot be used as an antiviral? This quinolone is an antibiotic, means antibacterial, right? This quinolone, it cannot be used as antiviral. Why not? Because virus don't have enzyme that then how do, they in a how do they proliferate? Virus? Yes. Uh, they use host cells enzyme. They use host cell enzymes. That's why if this drug, quinolone, is not working against the host cell enzyme, then definitely it will not have any effect to virus because virus is a share the same machinery of host cells, right? So virus does not have its own enzyme for this kind of a gyrase or the topoisomerase. So that's why there is no specific target for virus. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tekjun. Let's move on. Okay, do you see the do you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Yes. Now we are done with this piece. Uh, we heard Tekjun's presentation for the mechanism of quinolone. At least we learned the two different kinds of mechanisms for antibacteria. One was the cell wall blocking. The other one was uh, the DNA synthesis blocking. Still, we didn't cover uh, protein synthesis and also metabolism attacking. We'll have a chance to talk about it later. Now, today we are moving to virus thing. And first question was, how small is the virus? There was a, uh, for some comparison with the other things, I gave you some problems. You remember what is the size of a virus? Very nanometer on average. About 100 nanometer. And some answers like this. You know, I spent some time to tell you that let's not use this kind of more mathematical terms. Let's use more like this. Okay. So the size we can see is about 200 nanometer or 0.2 micrometer range. And there is some physical law about this. So some of uh, the physicists, I hoped to hear the name, but nobody gave you the name other in your answers. But anyway, if you use a visible light as our source of communication, then half of that wavelength is physical limit of 
these observations. So that means our visible light, uh, the to human, uh, the visible light is 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer. I said to human, that means for different animals, maybe the visible light range can be different. So for example, so some insect like a bee, honey bee, they can see much shorter wavelengths than this, about 200 nanometer. They can see UV as a color. And some other uh, life forms, they can see IR. They can look up that range. So this is only for humans. So anybody has uh, seen the name of the, the physicist who discovered this observation? We can see only half of those wavelengths of our visible light. Anybody? Okay, that physicist's name is Abe. So he found this physical law because of this event, diffraction limit. Below this range, there is a significant diffraction happens. Now, some of you gave uh, the, some comment that maybe the size of this light should be smaller than the target to reflect from the surface. What does it reflect? In Korean, what does it reflect? Pansa. It's a pansa. Uh, if the light hit the surface of uh, some object, it can be reflect. But reflect, if, if it is a rebound, there are two different kinds of observation we can see. One is a reflect, one is a scatter. Salam. What's the difference between reflect and scatter? When the light hits the surface of an object, the light can be bounced. Reflect is a bouncing of that light, correct? But scatter is also bounce, right? Then what is the difference between scattering and reflection? The wavelength change. Wave, both of the cases, wavelengths do not change. Well, there is a some scattering, like a Raman scattering. Yes, there is a some scattering, they change wavelengths. But lately, uh, the scattering, the main scattering, they don't change. Raman scattering is a kind of exception and also the smaller portion than regular scattering. No idea? Basically, scattering and reflection is almost the same phenomena. Just reflection is if the surface is very smooth and all the input light coming together and then leave it together, then that's reflection. If the surface is not smooth, and then it is, the reflection is a random direction that is called as a scattering. Okay, both of them is the same. Uh, the fan, almost the same phenomena, just the different directions of the light. So one of you said also, I think a virus is the smallest object that we can see through optical microscope. Well, if a virus size is maybe bigger than 200 nanometer, in ideal case, if the alignment of uh, uh, the microscope is really good, maybe big virus, maybe you can see, but if it is below 200 nanometer, if it is 100 nanometer, it's almost impossible to see the virus. And some of you also said, SEM or other tunneling techniques have a more small object. Yeah, that's true. SEM is an optical microscope. What is SEM stand for? What does it stand for? S is a scanning. Scanning electron, electron microscope. Yeah, very good. Scanning electron microscope. So this is not using light. This is using electron beam. And that resolution is quite different. So this technique is not optical microscope. This technique is utilizing different techniques. And 
theoretically, the minimum size we can see is about 200 nanometer, but actually, practically, it's much bigger than that. Even though we use a blue light, still there is some issues around that wavelength, and practically about 500 nanometer. This is practical limit we can see the object with the two different spots. The resolution limit of optical microscope is practically about 500 nanometer. If it is a really well-designed microscope, very carefully aligned microscope, maybe you can reduce that a little further, maybe 400, 300, but practically about 500 is the maximum we can see. And the main reason for this problem is not reflection or not scattering. The main reason is diffraction. What is the diffraction in Korean? Feather. It's a feather, it's a diffraction. What is a diffraction? Can you explain the diffraction? When object meet light, or light hit uh, the object, there can be different phenomena we can observe. One is reflection. Similar things we said, uh, scattering, if it's a different direction, okay? Both of them are very similar to each other. Diffraction is uh, one of them. Reflection, one of them. Re reflection is already recovered. Reflection, scattering is one kind. And maybe you mentioned the refraction, culture. That's another kind. That's reduced light speed. That's a refraction in other media. That's another kind. Now we are talking about the diffraction. Can you can you explain what is a diffraction and when it happens? Uh, it is kind of bending of waves when they meet kind of obstacle. When they meet a very big obstacle, what happens? Sejin's explanation, explanation is a quite good explanation, but it happens in under some conditions. Dong. Somebody was about to oh. say something. Mm. Go ahead. Diffraction is, is when many light waves interfere with each other. So they go to, uh, they make other patterns when they pass through that object. Uh, I, don't, I can't exactly. Dong is explaining about the interference. So that is as that is the result of a diffraction. So my question was, Sejin's uh, the definition of the light change its path direction. Yes, that's a diffraction. And my question was, when it when does it happen? If light hit very big obstacles. Oh, the big obstacle or the big object, then either they reflect or they scatter. If the surface is smooth, they reflect. Surface is not smooth, they scatter. They do not diffract. Okay, so either it has some small slit or it has some object, sometimes they can deflect. But my question is, when do they prefer to deflect rather than reflect or scatter? Okay, you guys may have heard about the Young's slit, double slit experiment. So that's also using diffraction. Okay, diffraction is maximized when the light wavelengths and also object size is similar to each other. Okay, then diffraction is maximized. If object is much bigger than the light wavelengths, either reflect or scattering happens. If object is much smaller than light wavelengths, what do you think? Light is just ignore the object, it just passes through. Okay, only when the light wavelength is quite close to the object size, 
then diffraction is maximized. So using this information, you guys may have heard about X-ray diffraction to figure out the molecular structure. So to do that, for those molecular, molecular the structure identification, molecular structure means the distance between atomic position recognition aligned through different atoms. Then you can think about the atom, atom to atom distance. That's about 1.5 angstrom or 0.15 nanometer, right? Then what wavelength of X-ray is best wavelength for that kind of X-ray diffraction, do you think? Mm. X-ray similar to that distance, atomic distance. What is it? X-ray. Uh, so X-ray can have a very broad range. Uh, Shorter one we say hard X-ray, longer one we say soft X-ray. So in terms of wavelengths, what wavelengths would you expect to see? It's a 0 0.1 nanometer yeah. around that range. That is the right wavelengths you need to use for X-ray diffraction experiment. Makes sense, right? To get to those good diffraction data, you need to have a strong response. That's why you need to choose that wavelength. If you wanted to see molecular structure, you should think about bond lengths of atoms. That's approximately 1.5 angstrom. Around that range of X-ray light should be right choice for X-ray diffraction experiment. Okay, so because of this diffraction, anything about 200 to 300 nanometer range of the obstacles, if they exist inside the cell or in any uh, the material, now they we cannot see them clearly because the light path is a change. They make those a whole image is a blur. It's not sharp images. And this limitation is very difficult to break. So this is almost for a long time, people believe that this is impossible to look at. So here, one of you said, comment, and I felt a little strange, said maybe to begin with the conclusion, okay, very strong comment, and said, dust mites, it's a jip jindagi, munji jindagi, which are about 200 nanometer size, uh, minimum size we can see. I thought a little strange and I looked up um, some images. So this is Jip Jindagi, uh, the images. By the way, this is not optical images. This is a uh, same image, scanning electron microscope image, okay? So that's why this is not, this does not disprove the sentences here, but even under microscope, the optical microscope, this is optical microscope, a little different uh, the technique. Uh, so-called dark field image, but this one is optical microscope. Something wrong here, right? What's wrong? Can you correct? We are talking about one small dot, whether that dot we can see or not. If the object is about 200 nanometer size, we cannot see this kind of a shape. It should be one dot, right? And I checked what was the mistake from this sentence. And I figured out later, this should be 200 micrometer. Okay, so 200 micrometer is much bigger than our regular cells. So we can see this kind of shape. This is optical microscope. And under electron microscope, we can see much more, uh, you know, detailed structure like this. But this is a different the source uh, of light, if you call them light, okay? Now, this is a good summary of those uh, definition of a resolution. And if you uh, the read through this, the 200 nanometer of a resolution means if there are two different spots, whether we can distinguish them as a two spots or we should see them as a one spot. If we cannot distinguish those two, then to us, it look like one spot. That's why we can say the general optical microscope, best of best resolution is about the 200 nanometer. 
around this range, now you cannot see the shape. It just look like this is one dot. Okay, that's kind of a limitation. Now, virus is smaller than this, usually. Virus is about 100 nanometer. So even though they show their shape, if you look at them, you cannot see their structure. It may just look like a one dot. Okay, that's the reality. Now, based on this, can we see the virus under the microscope? My answer would be no. Nope. It will be just uh, you know one dot. You cannot see as a shape. All those shape looks like those landing on the moon kind of a spaceship or different kind of shapes. Those are not optical microscope images. They are all electron microscope images. Okay, electron microscope images to make those samples. Usually you make a vacuum sample, remove those all air and dry. And also you need, sometimes you need to spray metal powder on the surface. So they are not live samples. They are all dead, um, the sam dead samples. And also dried and you know, fully distorted samples. Then here one question is, conventionally the doctors, how did they, how did they know whether the disease is caused by bacteria or virus? What do you think? Okay, after, you know, past cells discover that the disease is not automatically happens, there is pathogens. Those pathogens can be bacteria or virus or parasite or different kind of pathogens. In their time, even they realize that there is some bad bugs, even though they don't know what they are, at least they could filter those materials. And if the pathogen pass through that filter, or if you can remove that pathogen by filtering, if you can remove it, then they define it as bacteria. If the pathogen passes through, even though you filter several times, still they pass through and that they can infect their host again, then they define that as a virus. It's rough definition, but most of the cases it works. Then you can assume that you know, those, the conventional filter, what can be the pore size of the filter? If you think about the conventional Dogani filter, if you just filter through, then virus can pass through. Bacteria cannot. Then you can assume, you can estimate the filter pore size, right? What can be the pore size? Or if you have done a other biological experiment, if you buy Good filter membrane. What is the most common filter membrane pore size? It's approximately 0.5 micrometer. 0.48 nanometer, uh, 0.48 micrometer, 480 nanometer. That's kind of a regular pore size. If you wanted to filter further, maybe 200 nanometer of the filter pore is also available. But usually about a half micron is a regular filter we utilize. So that is in between 100 nanometer and one micrometer size of bacteria and virus. Okay, so this is a last chance I underlined the size of a virus. Okay, new target for our uh, the treatment. Okay, one of those, the question was lysogenic cycle. And you guys gave quite good answers here and there. Typically, the examples of lysogenic virus is a bacteriophage. Okay, good. Not only bacteriophage. And important word here is, in this lysogenic cycle, now the bacteriophage, this is a virus. Virus affecting bacteria is a bacteriophage. Phage is a virus. This virus integrate into the host genome. So this is a key word. So usual life cycle, lytic cycle, virus infect their host. They multiply. They make their genomic information and they make their protein coat and reassemble and break out and come out. So this is the active life cycle. But sometimes 
they hide inside the host. They don't show up, but they make their copy, integrate their gene inside the host genome. They integrate. Let's just say originally they were cyclic form of DNA they had or RNA, and they make linear DNA, and this linear DNA is inserted into genome of the host, and they do not make a protein code. Then it's very difficult to say whether this genome, whether this genome is virus infected or not. It's very difficult if they don't show any symptom. It does not only happen to the bacteria, it can happen to bigger animal too, human being too. So same thing, let's just say influenza virus. Influenza virus is also RNA virus, but they can make DNA. And that DNA can be inserted into genome of, of the host cells. And if you scan our genome sequences, so about 20 years ago, human genome project is kind of finished. And then when we sequenced all of our genomes, and then when we compared our genome structure with other life forms, including virus, we found surprising discovery that many of our genome sequences, they are very similar to many different kinds of virus. How many percent of our genome is a concept of the consist, uh, consist of a virus gene? Can you guess? Our gene is quite big, 3 billion base pair. Any random number would you try, Juan? 90%? 90%? It's a little too much. So we are 10% human and 90% the virus. Uh, about 10 years ago, when they compared our genome, they counted about 8%. 8% of our gene is either derived from virus or somehow related to virus. The number can vary. Maybe it can be 10% or 20%. It's an amazingly high number. That means we are carrying virus gene a lot and also many, many copies. You can imagine that the virus gene is much smaller than human genome. That's why the copy number can be many. Now, we can, we can also think opposite way, whether this virus invaded our body and then it inserted their gene into our genome or opposite way, some part of our genome is fragmented and encapsulated into the protein coat and they survived themselves. Maybe our gene is the source of a virus generation, right? We don't know whether which is the first, which is the chicken and which is the eggs. Anyway, important thing is, those gene sequences, even virus, bacteria, or human, we share all the same genetic information, genetic structure, DNA. Only we count is their sequences. And amazingly, very high percentage of those sequences we share with the virus. We don't know which goes which, but anyway, we are communicating by sharing those informations a lot. So not only virus and plasmid, now, we, if you compare those two, plasmid is a small DNA in bacteria, and virus is also small either DNA or RNA structures. If you compare those size, which one is bigger, do you think? Plasmid or virus? Actually, size-wise, they are quite similar. It can be kilo base pair. Base pair means if it's a DNA, then one DNA of the base pair is one, then kilo means is a thousand. So it can be a small one is a thousand base pair, big one is a hundred thousand of the base pair. So the size is quite similar, virus and plasmid. In comparison, bacterial genome is much bigger, maybe mega base pair, minimum 10 times to the hundred times. In comparison, human genome is a 3 billion base pair, maybe even 1,000 times bigger than bacterial or the genome, not surprising. Now, 
in, in terms of the size, virus and plasmid, they are very similar to each other, right? Then what's the difference between virus and plasmid? Basically, they are either DNA fragment or RNA fragment, and they can carry on, they can transpect and, and move to other host cells, and they can make a protein. And by this case, they can generate quarter protein, so-called capsid protein, and then they can formulate it themselves as one particle and trans uh, infect other cells. In comparison, plasmid is a kind of a naked DNA. They do not make a capsid, or they do not make a quarter protein. But this plasmid DNA is shared by bacteria to help each other. So in that sense, maybe virus plasmid is very similar to each other, almost the same. It's just a genetic information. Bacteria utilize plasmid because it is helping them. But virus is kind of a enemy. It's a killing the bacteria. That's why bacteria developed the attacking the method to virus. That's why they are protecting themselves, utilizing this capsid or envelope. It's only the matter that whether they are helpful material or the bad materials. Exactly this is about the probiotic versus antibiotic relations. Other than that, plasmid, virus, biological terms, they should be considered almost the same, isn't it? It's just a DNA fragment, RNA fragment. If you talk about virus is alive or not, exactly the same argument we can do for plasmid. Plasmid is alive or not, it's exactly the same question we can give. At least we can tell either virus or plasmid they communicate with us very closely, utilizing exactly the same machinery we have. In the sense, these guys are at least the partial life structures, we can tell, maybe. Okay. Now moving to the Relenza and Tamiflu. I gave you the question that, what is the difference between these two? So left side is a Relenza, and right side is a Tamiflu. The backbone structures are quite similar, but they are quite different. You guys gave quite good answers. Someone said, Tommy flu has an acid esterification, okay? So here's one acid, and then there is an esterification blocking this side. Tectron said many different things. Tectron, would you repeat what you said? What are the changes between these two? Uh, first thing is that as Torification and okay, yes, certification and a more simple structure that there Simpler. is no alcohol function in Tamiflu. Okay, so as an end result, this tummy, the, this compound relenza, this can be used only for the spray. Tamiflu, we can use for oral drugs, we can eat them. So by looking at those structures, this is simpler, and then removed a lot of these hydroxyl groups, and removed these groups too, and make it smaller, and all together, this compound is, has some different property from this compound. What is the biggest change of that property? Can you tell? What property was changing by leaving these hydroxyl groups? and also by blocking this uh, carboxyl acid as ester. What polarity. property was it changing? Sorry? Polarity. Polarity, which is a polar? The lens is polar. The lens. Okay, what does that mean, polar? Uh, electron has a... Uh, Direction or good starting. Electron has a direction because it is a separated. It's not evenly distributed. Some part of electron is moved to the other part. It forms a dipole. That's the original meaning of a polar. So to make a polar, 
if it's a two-body dipole, it's easy to define. But if there are many things like this, then polarity is a little ambiguous at all. Okay. As a result, if the compound is a polar, it is a more, it is easier to mix together with the water. Right? Polar compounds is a water soluble. We can say so. Then water soluble. Can you find the other term? Rather than polar? Hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. Filling means like. Hydro means water. Like water property. So if this is a hydrophilic, then how do you call this molecule? Hydrophobic. It's a hydrophobic. Phobic means hate. Hate water and like water. So hydrophilic, hydrophobic. So this is a very important parameter in drug development. And if the compound is very hydrophilic, then it cannot penetrate the cell membrane. That's why this compound, if you take this as an oral drug, it cannot be observed to our body. It can just pass through from one end to the other end very quickly. That's why this compound cannot be used as an oral drug. This can be used a direct delivery to the cells using spray. That's the only way we can do it. Okay. By making this compound more hydrophobic, too hydrophobic is not good either, but reasonably hydrophobic, then this compound has a very good chance to be observed to our body. That, is, that makes the big difference between relenza only spray drug into more convenient oral drugs. This kind of a trick has been used over and over in drug discovery. This is a salicylic acid. This compound is too hydrophilic. If you take this, then it just passes through. To, make, to help the absorption, we add this kind of motif. Two ways. One way is a acidification on this side. The other way is a blocking this or removing this. Now in this case, acidification, but by adding acid motif here and acidification here. And as a result, this molecule is more hydrophobic than this molecule. And this molecule's name is the famous aspirin. The active components of this molecule is a salicylic acid. If you take aspirin, it's absorbed. Later, it's hydrolyzed here. Release this salicylic acid. That is an active component. Okay. Very similar approach has been used to morphine to heroin. This is a morphine. It's a famous illegal drug, morphine, for anti uh, the pain of the drug. It has uh, two hydroxyl groups here. It's a hydrophilic. What do you do to make it hydrophobic? You have seen some trick here in aspirin. If you think this is too hydrophilic, I want to increase the dose absorption. What can you do? Exactly the same trick you can do, adding acetyl group here and here. This makes this morphine's absorption 100 times stronger. And this drug's name is heroin. Basically, these two materials are exactly the same material. Just that this one is water soluble and just passes through. By adding two acetyl group here, make it hydrophobic. And this drug's capability increase 100 times. Okay. So this is some control of those drug molecules. And one of you asked the, the wonder any other uh, the factors about this. So I said one thing of those. Now our time is up. Actually, I prepared some material like that, but this one we are going to talk about later. Let's just skip for now. Okay, uh, let's finish uh, the today's class here. So next lecture is a Thursday, 2 p.m. And again, uh, the assignment, I saw the six of you uh, the chose your drug as anti-viral uh, drug. One uh, the key point, you know, when you prepare your presentation materials, think about uh, what kind of a mechanism we covered so far. And it would be better to find uh, some unique new mechanism, specifically unique for antiviral. Then you may think, why this viral drug is different from anti, uh, antibiotic, antibacterial, okay? And also to make a good presentation, 
you don't need to say too many different things. You have only five minutes, maximum 10 minutes. You focus on what is delivery message you want to uh, underline, okay? You can repeat that part two or three times and make it clear what message you want to deliver. That will be important to practice when you make your presentations, okay? Anyway, uh, the similar way, uh, if it's a little late, then you can send me uh, the your file uh, the, to my email. And also, the, if you modify your file, then anytime you can send me by email as an updated file, okay? Any urgent question for today? Okay, if not, we finish uh, the for now. And then uh, the son, can you talk after this? Okay, guys, see you on Saturday. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm.